I'd like to start off our panel and uh, leave with a few questions. And we will. what we'll start to do is we'll go through um, and ask each of you some of the beginning questions. And then we'll have some of the more um, interesting and exotic questions afterwards. <laughs> and I'll ask for volunteers. And if at any point you would like to add to the questions or change them, feel free to, um, to modify them as you need. Um, or ask, you know, it, it should be open. If you have any further questions you'd like to ask the rest of the panelists, feel free to as well. Our first question today is, um, what advice would you give for the students in choosing an MBA program? Do you want to start with this? Sure. Um, can you commit the time needed to accomplish the program and the financial resources so you can get from the beginning to the end? So, and the, also look at location. Make sure that you can physically get to the program or if it's online. Um, just because you don't want to start a program and then have to stop in the middle uh, because of family issues or something else comes up in your life. So um, that's my answer. Well, I felt like um, you'd be more successful if you have access to strategic level information within your company because many of the projects and coursework that you do in a master's level program, you really need that information uh, about strategy, about um, financial results, and that sort of information. So if you don't have that level of access, you, you're you at a disadvantage, I think. Along the same lines, I think you should find an MBA program that complements your undergraduate degree uh, rather than just continues with it. So if you're marketing, you go finance. If you're a home ec major, you still uh, pick a marketing uh, field or something that you can build on and take into uh, any industry, so to speak. And what you should be looking for, I think, is a program that allows you then to take what you have from the classroom and take it to us across industries and basically be able to leave what you've been doing and step into another field. I also agree that uh, make the commitment and get it as quickly as you can because you do have other obligations, whether it's family, whether it's work. And once you start having to divide your time, it becomes very frustrating. So. Get get in one and stay with it. <laughs> That's all great points too, and and I, and I would you know definitely concur with this concept of you know especially as you're getting your MBA, um, you, you, things are going to change right in your career perspective and your life perspective. So making sure that the program is going to be flexible enough for you that you wouldn't have to stop and start. But I would also add too, I think it's really important to make sure that whatever program you go after, that there's a good balance between you know what I would call uh, full time instructors right and instructors who are adjuncts or folks that can bring a little bit of that you know the little nuances business changes very very quickly and we need to get a little bit of a little more color on well here's what the text might say but let me explain to you what's starting to transform in the business space you know so so you can really come out of the program with some real world experience or knowledge behind you I think that's critical <clears throat> My biggest part I'd have to agree with with the rest of the panel here so far is to make sure you have that time commitment that you can make for whatever the duration of the program is. And at my at my initial open house at ASU, one of one of what turned out to be my favorite professor opened up with when every one of you leave this room today, you know, speaking to all the new the new applicants, was to go home and tell all of your friends and your family that for the next two years you're gonna be committed to this <laughs> and not have time to hang out to go out to bars, to whatever whatever you had before, they said make sure right away you go in and you tell every everybody you know that this is your new time commitment for the next two years. And I did that, and that was probably one of the most beneficial things to not have that pressure from friends, from family, from neighbors, from coworkers. They they knew exactly where I was every night after work, every weekend. So just the the added pressure wasn't there, and that was that was a huge benefit. So. Uh, I think you go and get your MBA for the relationships. You know, you're going to get a good education no matter where you go. But uh, at some point, it is who you know. And so, if you're going to do business, if you're going to get into industry, you want to get to the next level. It's going to have to be about relationships. Um, I'd also add that uh, that wherever you decide to get your MBA, you need to have your dreams in order. You need to understand what it is that you want to, to tackle. Maybe it's climbing the corporate ladder. Maybe it's starting your own business. But whatever school you choose, make sure that you have the right relationships with it, that they have a, uh, a strong alumni group or even just your cohort. If you can get to know some of them before you fully commit, or you know that might not be a bad idea because they're going to be the ones that help you 
realize your dreams. And I guess because I'm the moderator, I get to answer that as well. <laughs> <laughs> I get to I, I want to add one thing, and I wanted to build on what you were talking about, about relationships. Because I know it's really helped me. When you're going to look at a program, people will tell you to look at the courses and look at the faculty and look at the placement and the alumni. But another important piece are your fellow students. And I really would encourage you to talk to people who are currently students or have been students. Because part of your experience is not just the faculty in the classroom, but it's all the other students that you're going through this program with. And a lot of the learning happens from other students. And you want to find people that you feel um, are looking for the same things that you are, are in the program for the same reasons, and are, are interested in learning in the same type of way that you are. And I think that's a really good way for you to judge a fit between you and the program. So now the next question is, um, we'll ask you a little bit more about your own experiences. What are the three most important things you learned in your MBA program? And we'll start on the other, we're going to start down at the other end so that we don't make Julie go first all the time. Oh boy, I was hoping to. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I would say that uh, you're not the smartest person. That's, that's number one. You may think that you're the smartest person, but when you get into your MBA, you're going to realize that there's a lot of, there's a lot of very talented individuals. Um, I would also add that uh, I think number two would be that um, you really have to, uh, you really have to, to learn how to build and create from almost nothing. I mean, you should be able to, you should be able to take your dreams that you've been thinking about for the last 10, 5, 15 years, and you should be able to create those dreams from ground zero through your MBA and actually realize some of those uh, maybe milestones, if you will. So start your business. You know, a lot of people wait, and they wait for the right timing. It's kind of like kids. It's never going to be a right, there's never going to be a right time. But it's going to have to happen at some point. Um, and, then, uh, and then the last thing I, I think is, is uh, I believe in travel. So, you know, being a, 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 a Thunderbird MBA, um, you know, global is, is, is my playground. So do what you like to do. I think travel is going to be a big part of the new economy, and, uh, and so I learned to, to travel and enjoy it a lot more. Just recently coming out of ASU, everybody kind of realized that they've got a, a heavy focus on, on three kind of key components. No matter what class you're going into, be it supply chain, accounting, management, whatever, everything is focused around team building. So cooperation within a team, how well you work with the team, do you cooperate? Do you fulfill your role? You know, do you hold your own weight was one of the biggest parts. And within every team, somebody always has to step up as the leader. So ASU is definitely focusing on making individuals, kind of forcing them to act in a leadership role, see if that's where they're comfortable, if that's truly the direction they want to go. And then also just kind of like we talked about before was just dedication. You, you have to put in the time and the effort into all of the classwork and they, they really push your boundaries on what you're comfortable with, and that's exactly what you find when you get into the real world and into leadership roles, management roles. You're, you're really pushed to the edge of your boundaries. Um, I think you know, the first thing, the most important thing for me was really probably a, a learning or addition, additional in-depth learning of self-awareness, right? Back to, back to the point that was made earlier, right? You're not the smartest person in the world. Uh, I was you know, successful in my career and, and doing great things, but I quickly realized there's a lot of really smart people out there, and they're in my class, right? So self-awareness for me was, was by far number one. I think the second thing, again, was just an enhancement to my ability to be flexible, adaptable, and deal with crisis management, because at the end of the day, a lot of things happen in your lives, right? I was getting my MBA, I had a wife, I got kids being born, I got all sorts of things going on. So. Uh, it really honed in my ability to try and multi multitask and manage and prioritize things uh, as, as the landscape was constantly changing. And I think really, you know, the, the third component of really what I learned from, from the program was not only from a content perspective, obviously there were a lot of key contents and concepts that I thought that I had really understood well throughout my, my, my career, but but I was able to take a deeper dive. But what I really took away from it was a, a, what I call a vantage point, right? Basic concepts uh, or in-depth concepts 
in the educational space that I thought I understood, but what I realized was my instructors had a different perspective, a different set of optics. So something that I would maybe pick up and read and thought I learned and knew and understood, there were five or six different applications and different organizations of, of execution to make those concepts successful. So it gave me a, it gave me a much different perspective on optics and vantage point. I think coming out of uh, undergraduate uh, school and going to work, uh, you got a little bit of a ego and uh, a feeling that you've accomplished something. Now it's time to uh, conquer the business world. And I think what the MBA program did for me uh, shortly after I graduated from uh, Purdue was uh, introduce me to the idea, again, of teamwork and that you don't have all the answers. And that because of the diverse workforce, the classroom, et cetera, that you need to find the skills and the talents of everybody that uh, is around you. Everybody has something to offer. Leadership's another thing that comes out of it. We've mentioned that already, but uh, you'll have a way to lead even as part of case studies and uh, everybody's got something that they're good at that you pick up a piece of uh, the lead on a, a portion of a project that you're working on and somebody else does this, but uh, just to understand that uh, everybody is unique and has something to bring to the table. The other thing that I think at the end of a day that you get from an MBA program is uh, to learn to simplify the issue. Uh, so often you get into something and you get lost in the uh, the menage of the uh, issues and you step back and say what is really the issue whether it's customer whether it's uh, uh, production related or what have you simplify the issue and then uh, go about analytically coming up with alternatives and uh, which direction you want to go and then to be able to communicate that internally and externally so my natural talents lie in communications. My undergraduate degree was in organizational communication. My early jobs were in public relations and media relations and community relations. And so I'm really good at that communication thing. What I used my MBA to do was to round out my weak areas. So economics, finance, accounting, the things that are dirty words to me, they're really <laughs> hard, but I, it so rounded out my experience and gave me more, I just learned a lot from those areas that were naturally weak for me. So I learned how to read a financial report and how to interpret what's important in it. I had never done that before. I'd never had the opportunity in the jobs that I'd been in. I worked in um, television. I worked for the Phoenix Suns. I worked for um, an ad agency. And so I just never had that opportunity. So that was a, that was a great um, addition to my education. And then the best advice that came out of that for me was follow the money. Find out your sources and uses of cash and follow that because if you right. know that, then you know how to build, say, marketing programs that are going to take advantage of, you know, that are going to maximize your sources and uses of cash. It was a, a revelation to me, and it was way better, way more exciting than just writing a press release. <laughs> <laughs> well, when I started my MBA program, I was just one year out of NAU. So I was a young student, and so I learned confidence that. Uh, when you're just starting out, you need the extra confidence. So that really helped. The other thing was, I am glad I started my MBA program before getting married, before kids, <laughs> before all the commitments. So I got it done and over with, and then I could move on to the next chapter of my life. So um, if you have the opportunity to do it sooner than later, please do it. And the other thing is, in life, you will learn, not just in business school, but just in life in general, that you need other people, and other people can complete you. You need somebody, a good CPA, a good lawyer, a good you know, financial advisor, whatever it is, everybody together will help make you successful, but you can't do it on your own, and that's what several other people said, that you learn how to make teamwork so you can be successful. I think it's interesting that you'd say to start early because my perspective is to do it after you've been in business for a while because you learn more about business in general and then you you know how to fill the gaps. But I, I respect your position as well. It's just different. It depends on what's important to you. Yeah, okay. yeah I think it's that depending on where you come from, you're mm -hmm. taking out different things. Mm -hmm. I think we it's really interesting what different types of um, things everybody's mentioned depending on how they came into it mm -hmm. and what they were looking for out of the program. Um, I wanted to just build one one thing that Mike had said. Um, when I first entered my MBA program, I was overwhelmed by how much there was to know. Um, there's so much. And then it took a while to realize it's not about what you know, it's about how you know. And so the program isn't as much about learning everything. And, and I teach marketing. There's no way that people can leave a course and know everything there is to know about marketing that's going to last more than a month. 
right? Mm -hmm. And but the really important is, thing is to know how to think about it when you're faced with a problem. How do you solve a problem? Mm -hmm. And I think that's the biggest skill you get out of a pro is how do you figure out mm -hmm. how to solve the problem. Okay, so now we're going to look back on our past experiences and, and figure out where we, what we missed. I'd like to ask, what one course do you wish you had taken while you were in your MBA program that you missed? Do you, um, Mike, do you want to start with you? I think uh, based on looking backwards, having gotten mine many years ago, uh, I wished I would have taken more financial courses that dealt with uh, deal making uh, because I have just eventually fallen into positions where I was either trying to sell a company, buy a company, and putting uh, debt equity situations together to understand that better. Uh, that was not a direction at that time. Now, I've also been fortunate enough to be surrounded with people that understood that, but I didn't have that uh, background personally, so I had to pick that up uh, after the fact, so to speak, rather than having done it in the classroom. Yeah, so I think probably looking back, I, I, it would probably uh, be you know in the area of torts or contract law. Um, I, I had a little bit of experience and exposure to it in my undergrad, and a lot of what I do has a lot to do with uh, contracts, setting up large, uh, long, long contracts for software, and hardware, and those types of things. So it took me a little while, uh, you know, after the program to spend time with some really smart people who understand contract law. Uh, the attorneys, but uh, but that looking back, that's probably one that I think would have been would have been interesting at a minimum, and certainly incredibly helpful for me from a cycle perspective in uh, in, my, in business. Probably just a slight deviant from that. One of the courses that I always wanted to take but couldn't squeeze the time in for it was negotiations. Um, one of the most important things I found that that when you get into to any kind of a business. Somebody has to negotiate everything from the office supplies you buy to purchasing property to negotiating your own salary. And if you don't understand where to start that process, you're you know, more than likely going to end up on the short end at the end of it. I, uh, I, I, I concur with all, of their, uh, with all of their classes that they would have taken. Uh, I think that your, your MBA should be a life-changing event. It shouldn't be something where you just go and you get your piece of paper and, and you're off. It should be your life-changing life event. Something you're proud of no matter where you go. Um, I would take another language course. I would get to learn another language. And, um, and that's life-changing. Since I'm a business owner, I wish I would have taken um, an entrepreneur course because that would have helped me, you know, rather than trying to learn it after my MBA, during my MBA. I couldn't have fit one more course in, <laughs> and I wouldn't have. But <laughs> if you could wave a magic wand, I would say that the market research course that I took had pretty dated material. It was probably the one course where I felt like it wasn't quite up to speed. Um, it wasn't as contemporary information as I had hoped. So that was something I had to go back and kind of fill in later with seminars and conferences and that sort of thing. Um, I'd like to, right now I'll open it up, and I'm going to ask a few questions, and you free, jump in and, and volunteer to answer, or volunteer your next door neighbor. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the first question is, um, can you tell us a little bit about your first job after your MBA program, and, and why you chose that as your entry point? Well, I always wanted to open my own business. I knew that since age five. So I didn't know what I was going to do. So I just jumped right in one month after I graduated with my MBA, started my business, and 18 years later, here I am. So it was just taking a risk and, and getting it done. So you find your passion, and you just do it. When I started my program, I was um, VP of PR for the Phoenix Suns, and I was um, working a lot of night and weekend events, and so I could only do my program online, so that's what I did, was the um, University of Phoenix online program. Um, but by the time I finished, I'd actually changed jobs, and I was VP of marketing for a company called Loretto Bay that was building a sustainable community in Baja, Mexico. And it chose me. I didn't really choose it. But um, I would say for neither of those jobs did I need an MBA. Um, but the job I'm in now at Phoenix Children's Hospital, advanced degrees are highly valued. And I don't know that I would have even been qualified or considered for the job that I have now without an advanced degree. And um, with so many MDs and PhDs <laughs> around us, they really value that. And they certainly um, look more favorably upon someone with a, a master's degree. So. 
after I got my uh, MBA, I was sure I was leaving the company to uh, go to Texas to get in the oil industry. And uh, <laughs> thank God I didn't do that because they hit some hard times right after that. I was all set to move to Houston, pick the bride out, and said, okay, here we're going, and uh, ended up staying the same place for 25 years. Had 14 different jobs in 25 years. Uh, and I guess I really didn't have a plan after I decided I wasn't going to Texas that uh, I would use it outside of the company I was working with. So uh, I didn't have that uh, magic wand that set me in a different <laughs> direction on uh, day one. But, uh, I think it pays off in the long run. Uh, when I got mine, I think there was only like 60,000 MBA students uh, per year. And I saw a number that uh, right now we're graduating about 126,000 a year. So that's a heck of a lot more. And I look at back at it and say, when I got out of school, everybody uh, that got a master's kind of stood out from the rest of the crowd. And I think today anymore, there's so many uh, college grads of 1.6 million in total, 175 business majors. It's a way to distinguish yourself, if not in that first job, somewhere down the line. The people will look at your resume and see that you have it. So. So my one, mine was kind of, well, everybody's is interesting, right? So it's always good to get perspective. But in my situation, I had decided to, to get my MBA, not from a career perspective, literally, be, uh, at the time I was a senior director of, of IT. And, and the reason why I wanted to get my MBA, because I always had a passion to teach as an adjunct professor. And that was my sole goal for getting the MBA. And I was in the middle of my, uh, back then you had to do a thesis. It was a four-month thesis class. And I just started off thesis, so I was going to wrap up my MBA. And lo and behold, the chief information officer at Meritage Homes, where I was at the time, uh, resigned. And so it was me and another gentleman. Another gentleman was, you know, very skilled. It was, it was a tough choice. And my boss, the CFO, who I still report to now, pulled me into his office and he said, you're, the, you're going to be the CIO. And part of the reason why is because you're getting your MBA in finance. Mm -hmm because it makes me think that you can still learn new stuff and you're, get, and you're not getting your MBA in IT. And obviously, was, you know, he's, a, he's a CFO, so he like five. So it's sort of interesting. It wasn't my intention in getting my MBA. Uh, I've been fortunate enough to be able to teach as an adjunct, but at the end of the day, it was a pivotal factor, I have to assume, uh, for getting a, you know, a very significant uh, change in role in the organization. So. The position that I'm in right now, I actually just started about three months ago. So it was just right after I graduated from my MBA. And the reason that it opened up doors there was I, I was a controller at my previous job and moved into a controller position where I'm at now, but they saw the MBA as an opportunity to use me as more than that where I'm at. So the, the actual accounting with this firm is a lot easier, so it opened up a lot of time. So they brought in somebody that had a heavier education so I can actually get more involved on the economic and research teams. I can get involved with the business development and, and also kind of help contribute to their senior team with making decisions on what direction the company is going to go. And the MBA was really the flag that they saw that, that they wanted to move that direction and bring in a different perspective than someone that can just crunch numbers. So uh, usually when you go for an MBA it's so that you can either run up the corporate ladder or so that you can get a little bit more experience, a little more breathing room so you can jump ship and form your own company. And uh, so I formed my own company. I wasn't interested in, in running the, the corporate ladder anymore. So we formed a small boutique uh, VC PE firm here in town. We've got a few employees. And, um, and we do some buy side and sell side transactions and we make investments from time to time. We're not a large firm, but, but that was my dream is to do it with my own money, do it with my own team and, uh, and build it. And so you've got to pick what you're track is going to be, I think. Are you going to go up the ladder, or are you going to form your own entity? I think it's interesting everybody still went in order. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very structured. <laughs> it's a classroom. <laughs> right. <laughs> Thinking back to your first job and what you're doing now, and especially for some of you that have done some different things, what do you think was a pivotal decision that you made in your career that had a big impact on who you are today? Some job choice that you made, a job to take or not to take or move? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 can, I can probably share it. You know, I started off in, as a fixed income guy back on Wall Street many, many years ago. So, you know, sort of um, in that financial space. And uh, at the time, it really, there really was, this is early 90s, there really wasn't an IT industry per se. It, 
this, this industry didn't exist. So I spent a little bit of time sort of dabbling, trying to write software that could eke out another 50 or 25 basis points out of a $250 million bond deal, you know, to make my bond deals a little more effective than my competitors. So I ended up having to take some time off to help a disabled sister. And when I went back into, uh, into business, that option was there because there was no IT industry. And so I got involved uh, in, in Wall Street on the IT side of the equation, and you know, sort of the rest is history. So I think as I look back, and, I, and I, my MBA is in finance, I teach finance, I'm still very heavily involved in finance, but at the end of the day, I think the, the thing that I enjoy the most is the fact that that industry, this, this IT industry, is, it really brings two things to bear, right? It's constantly changing. You're in a space where nothing's ever the same. Three years, three years from now, everything looks different. So it really keeps your, your learning abilities honed in. I have to constantly learn new things. And it's the one role in an organization as a CIO where I, I, get, I have to be a specialist in every part of the business. You know, the CFO who I report to really has to focus on treasury finance, accounting, but doesn't have to worry about how sales works or how legal works. So it's, it's really interesting. I think the comment was made about the all the different uh, classes that you, all the things you learn in your MBA outside of your specialty. And so for me, when I look back, that was, that's key to me, it's just that change uh, frequency that occurs that keeps my learning abilities honed in, and just the fact that it's the one role that I have to have deep knowledge of every function within the business in order to be successful. So. I, I like to, I like to add to Chris's statement, you know, once you get your MBA, and, and I, I take my hand out to you for teaching, um, to really be considered an expert in your field, teach. Mm -hmm. And uh, it doesn't have to be at, at um, you could be at the high school level, it could be at the mm -hmm. college level, it could be at any level, but if you wanna, if you really want to uh, be looked at as an expert in your field, it's a good idea to teach, and it's a great way to, it's a great way to give back. Yeah. Uh, I think that reality hit me in uh, 1999 when the tech bubble burst. And I was an I banker. I was an investment banker, and and uh, the next thing you know, I, I didn't have a job, and I was used to a certain lifestyle and a certain uh, kind of flair with with the uh, with the the title and the position, and um, and I realized that uh, the days of working for a company for thirty years mm -hmm. and getting a gold watch at the end, <laughs> those no longer existed. And so the MBA was insurance, and um, and, uh, and and I I was lucky that I'd always kind of believed, but I hadn't really practiced it too well. But I always believed that you should have at least two or three, maybe four or five separate sources of income. Um, and so that's when I I said, okay, I I think that uh, I need some insurance, and it's time to time to go and get your MBA. One uh, change that I made in a career was uh, I was recruited to go and run a company up in Canada that I didn't think was going to be successful. And uh, I knew when I went up there I was going to have my hands full. And I went to it's 25 people. It was losing money at the time. It was made up of an international team of uh, a guy from Chile that ran the warehouse, a guy from South Africa ran production, <laughs> a Nicaraguan ran quality control, Vietnamese were in the plant, and uh, I had enough of a communication issue that uh, <laughs> I found that a lot of times I was doing things myself, and that's when I, again, appreciated the fact that you surround yourself with people smarter than you. It makes your life incredibly easier if the finance guy, the HR person, uh, the operations person is smarter than you. Rely on them and use that. But I went up there knowing I was going to have my hands full, and it became a seven-day-a-week job. I went up there by myself and uh, had nothing else to do but work. And uh, within a month of getting up there, the plant was so disgusting, and the offices were full of mice that I tore the office down. People came in on a Monday morning. We had no office. We lived in a trailer from there. Mm -hmm. So you talk about going from kind of a corporate setting to something that... Uh, Hell, I didn't shave every day. I was wearing blue <laughs> jeans and uh, sweatshirts uh, as the president because I was doing all kinds of uh, tasks that uh, I didn't think I'd be doing at the uh, ripe old age of 50-something. But I, I did that, and I think it actually helps the resume at the end of the day when you can tell those stories about uh, what you try to do to transform a company and then get it sold. So I had my fingers crossed. I thought I was uh, stepping out on a limb. At, at times, and maybe I was, but I, I don't regret having done that. So, 
It wasn't a safe move, but you do it. <laughs> I would completely echo that. I had to really step out on a limb at one point, and I was, as I was thinking of what, you know, what was that pivotal moment for me. I worked 13 years for the Phoenix Suns, and it was a great job. I was there during the very best years, and um, it was fun. It was a prestigious job. People return your calls, mm -hmm. lots of perks. <laughs> I had a boss that I absolutely loved. He was a great um, mentor, coach, great boss. And to leave that was really risky, but I wanted to move beyond just being the PR person. I really had a love of marketing and I wanted to take that next step in my career. And really the degree wasn't so much, I didn't really pursue the MBA because of that. It was really the stepping out of that comfort zone and um, doing something different that, that is, is what pushed me. And um, I, I really pursued the degree more for a love of learning, but it's, actually, it's definitely had career benefits as well. Okay, so what we'll do, I, what I want to do is we've, we've really peppered you a lot with questions. So dig down into your past and come up with all the warts and the highlights. And Now I'll, I'd like to ask you a little more about um, some experiences you've had as a role in, in hiring MBAs, in recruiting. And, and tell us a little bit some of the skills you think that the MBAs that you've been seeing are missing. What types of skills do you think MBAs should have in your field that you're not seeing enough? Whoever wants to go first. <laughs> I'll, I'll go first. I don't, um, in my position, I don't, people who are MBAs don't really work for me, so that's not really an issue, but what I've noticed is work ethic in general, that there is a difference prior to current work ethic, so if, um, and the other thing is communication skills. A lot of people know how to text if they're young, but do they know how to talk on the phone? Do they know how to meet people? Do they know how to network? Those are the skills that you definitely need in business today. The thing I thought of really has almost nothing to do with a degree, and that's good judgment. Mm -hmm. You can't teach good judgment. Right. People who make good decisions can defend those decisions. That's hard to find. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think the other thing that uh, even the top business schools are now forcing uh, students to take is ethics. Mm -hmm. I think there's a real lack it's along the same lines of uh, work ethic is this whole idea that uh, your word is your bond. Mm -hmm. uh, people are relying on you and you break that bond. Uh, you, you've, you've made a mess of your career, I think, uh, at least in the company you're with. Mm -hmm. People just don't uh, think twice of taking shortcuts. You see all the uh, scandals at the uh, military academy and Harvard where uh, they have people cheating. And as you now interview kids and you ask them what is, kids, I say the undergraduates, uh, <laughs> if it's cheating when they share homework assignments and whatever, they don't, they don't think twice about right. sharing things. That That's uh, wrong. It's unethical. And... Uh, where that starts, where it begins, is certainly at home, but uh, schools now have to pick that up as something, as a requirement, I think. Yeah. I think, um, you know, in, in my experience, the MBAs that work for me, the, every single one of them, it's typically a scenario of they got their bachelor's degree or got almost done with their bachelor's degree, spent some time in the industry, and then went back, right, and, and acquired their MBA. So I think that, that speaks a little bit to the experience side of it. Um, but I will say, especially in the technology space, I think one of the biggest takeaways that I see with the, the distinction with my MBA students that I do not see with those who, who haven't gotten an MBA is communication and presentation. You know, it's, it's really great to have a wonderful thought and a wonderful idea and, and the answer to the company's problems in one particular space, but it's a whole other thing to be able to communicate that in front of the board, clearly, succinctly, to the point, you know, board of directors, CXO levels, we have you know attention spans of like four seconds because there's a thousand things going on. So those MBA students really can come in and, and execute where, to get what they need, right? Because they can communicate it and convey it properly to the executive team. That's a skill that can't be taught, right? It's through practice and through doing it over and over and you quickly realize what works and what doesn't work over time. So uh, it's extremely valuable. Unfortunately, I'm not really in a role right now where I get to hire any MBAs, but one of the things that I thought was incredibly crucial coming out of the ASU program was an organizational behavior course that we took that, that kind of goes off the point that was at the end of the table there of, of everybody learns differently, everybody works differently, mm -hmm. and as a society, we're shifting to these tech-driven, social media-driven employees that are coming in, and, 
And while they are very distracted in some of these things, they're also incredibly efficient at changing the things that we're all used to doing. And, and the, the point of the organizational behavior course was that even as a leader, it's not just important to look down and realize how to get results that you need, but it's also to look up and realize what you need to show that you're performing the other direction as well. And I think that's something that's, that's important that's coming out that's important to look for that. That's a great point. Mm -hmm. that's so um, so uh, I do hire and I hire MBAs and I, and I do consulting also. And I think the, uh, when we're talking about MBAs or we're talking about hiring someone in general, um, it really lies, I think, with the methodology of the employer and how they're hiring. And so what does that mean to you? And, and to me, it has to do more with dignity and fit. So I've had some beautifully talented uh, applicants, um, but did that fit the role for the position that I was hiring? And just because you look great on paper doesn't mean that that particular role is going to work for them. And so I think that um, for you, when you're looking, when you get your MBA and you're looking for a position, you should be looking at whether or not you fit in that role more than um, you know and I've been there you know where I was in a role that that it just didn't fit my personality I you know it, it could be momentum how quickly you work how slow you work how methodical you are how detailed you are um, big picture little picture um, so when you get your MBA and and I imagine everybody in here is or will uh, you've got to look at the fit, and because if not, then you're, end up, you're gonna end up getting fired. You're gonna end up wondering why, and, and there's often a loss of dig dignity there. So. <coughs> well, I'm really. We, I've been taking careful notes on all the things that you're hoping <laughs> that your MBAs would have, and, and and I wanted to pick up because I I heard you know we, global talking about global communication skills, mm -hmm. being able to communicate, being persuasive, and being able to understand different norms across the world. And the same thing with ethics as well. Um, and we, and at West, at our programs, we have been working a lot on building communications and ethics courses that that can help students. And I think, for me, one of the interesting things there when students come in, they say, "Well, I never thought I really could learn ethics." I mean, you either have it or you don't. Right. And and it's really not that simple because the world is much more complicated than we can ever experience in our own world. Mm -hmm. And so when we can present students with conflicts that bring into account people from different cultures, um, different global regulatory environments, where the trade-offs are different. We're exposing them to situations where they can start to think more introspectively about, is there really one right answer? Mm -hmm. and, and where they can start to make mistakes in a very forgiving environment. And I think it's the same thing with communications. We can teach people how to be persuasive and how to understand what the communication needs are globally in an environment where they get exposure to so many different things. So I'm relieved to hear um, on that part um, some of the things that we've been focusing on. I think we have time for one more question, mm -hmm. if that's correct. Um, I want to ask a little bit, we have a broad range of industries um, represented here. What networking groups or forums or tools would you recommend to MBAs that are interested in getting into your industries? Well, I, I'm sorry. I belong to the National Association of Insurance and Financial Advisors. So find a group that belongs to your industry, and then you get to be surrounded by the best people in your industry. Um, and you get to know them and you get to network with them, that's really important. The other thing is I belong to three chambers of commerce, Phoenix, Tempe, and Scottsdale. So I know the business community, and then I also belong to the Better Business Bureau, and I also belong to um, ASBA, which is the Arizona Small Business Association. So as a business owner, you need to be in the community, knowing people in the community, do business with them, and they'll do business with you. And that's how I started my business, and that's what it's, it's been very successful for me. I think it's natural to f select groups that you feel comfortable in, mm -hmm. but I would caution you from doing that because you're going to succeed there anyway. You're going to mm -hmm. meet the same type of people that you are. 
So I would say pick networking groups that might challenge or stretch you a little bit. I think I'm all about filling gaps uh, today. Yeah. Um, but that introduces you to new people and different types of people. And I also think the, the question, as it was stated to us, is what networking groups do we believe are most valuable to new graduates? I would say figure out where the boss in your dream job is networking and find right. that kind of group and hang out there and meet those people. And once Absolutely. you connect with them, then you're ripe for hiring or promotion within those organizations. Coming from uh, the food industry, which certainly covers or can uh, apply to any industry, is our trade associations. You need to find out who they are, and they usually uh, have a list of who their uh, members are, so you can start to track companies. I think I'm a fan of LinkedIn, and yet I'm very selective about who I allow to uh, into my group because I see people with 500 plus friends, <laughs> and you don't know that many people. You certainly don't know much about them, but you know some people just reach out and want, want you to be connected. And I think if you use that tool right, you can find so many people. Uh, with the 100, I only allow about 100 people. To be in my group, so if somebody new and more interesting comes along, somebody goes off my list. <laughs> <laughs> my mother's no longer one of my top hundred. <laughs> but uh, what you find is that uh, with even just a hundred, I supposedly have access to uh, six million people, and and it really is a, a good tool that if you use LinkedIn and you start to use it routinely, you can reach out and find anybody you want, uh, anywhere in the world, any industry. Uh, yeah, it's it's got a great search tool in it, and uh, I, I strongly suggest you do that. I don't know how easy it is to get access to recruiters because recruiters always work for companies rather than for you. But I have a pretty good network also of recruiters that if I call, they'll return the call. And I've had a few jobs through recruiters, so you kind of get on their list that uh, you must have reason to uh, be hired so that uh, they can help you with the climate, what's going on in industries, and with particular clients on, on their part. So th there's all kinds of networking opportunities. but reach outside of your comfort zone to do it and uh, let people know why you want to talk to them and you don't ever want to ask somebody for a job you want to know if you know somebody in your industry do you know somebody in this company can you make an introduction for me that's how you want to use networking not to ask somebody something that they have to let you down no i'm not hiring today if you can use it in the right way people want to help you and they will people will help you yeah, those. I mean, those are all great points, and, and and I would I would you know I'm in the home building industry, so the way you get in there is you gotta well you gotta talk to him, get a whole bunch of money, and buy <laughs> land. <laughs> it's just as simple as that. But you know if you if you sort of distill what I do down into the technology space, right? I think I, I really agree with the comment that was made, which is figure out what your dream job is, and then go after that. There's a, you, you, in every industry or in every vertical, if you will, like, especially in IT, there's lots of different tracks that I could travel. You know, I could be an infrastructure person or an applications person or a business analyst, and you really got to figure out where do I want to be in my career and then go after that particular group. And there's tons of them, right? And it, it also helps you, to the point that was made, step out of a group that you just, it's going to be a piece of cake for. So it really forces you to sort of step out of your comfort zone, shake hands with people, and, you know, be in a place where you might be a little bit uncomfortable. And then I would also add, too, I think there's a lot of value in spending your time when you're going through your MBA program building that network of your stu of the students. I mean, you're in an MBA program, you're in a group of elite people that are gonna be successful executives or entrepreneurs in the future. So you keep them close to your network and you, you kind of evolve with them and, and they're gonna expose you to that, you, know, you might be able to get to the 101 on the LinkedIn <laughs> list, right? But they're gonna, be, they're gonna be in roles that are gonna expose you to a broad group of, of executives and leaders and entrepreneurs that you can also leverage as well. So, great, great resource to use. Kind of the, be the beauty about being involved in economic development is I'm kind of across all regions. We have members in, in real estate, food industry, you know, every, every sector of business is involved in the organization that I work with. And something like LinkedIn is, is crucial for our members to keep in contact with everybody that they meet across several meetings per week. But for actual people going into an MBA program, a piece of advice that I could give is when I was in my first class, I realized that everyone was kind of huddling into their groups and creating their own little small networks. So me and one of my classmates actually created kind of a social playground where we we invited everybody from the program to join in, where after class, weekends, everyone could communicate as a whole group instead of just trying to communicate across your five or six people in your team. 
And this actually created such unity among our class that that the people at ASU said they've never seen a stronger team leave the program before as as a, a, a one unit. Um, and it's led to so many good things that after the program, several of our of our classmates have found new jobs through those same people they connected with just through a Facebook page, including myself. The job that I got, I actually got referred onto the managing the uh, the hiring manager where I'm at now. So that network was incredibly crucial for for me finding my next job. So you know, I, I can't tell you the networking groups to go to, but I can tell you that you need to take an inventory of who you are so that way when you do get into an opportunity where you are networking you can succinctly and, and quickly tell that person who you are without stumbling and they know who you are because every time you meet someone you either build or destroy your brand so before you even go into the network and whatever network it is you're gonna you're gonna be involved with um, you need to know what kind of weaknesses you have, capture those so that they're not, they're not present. Um, and, and I work on that every day. I work on that all the time. My mom has always told me since I was a kid that I need to smile more. And she'd say, mijo, you know, you, you look like you're going to take down a Circle K when you <laughs> So, so I, I am constantly the, Trying to remember, you know, I got, I got a smile. So, but those, you know, those are subtle things. But let me tell you, it, it, yeah. it really is a big, big deal when you're starting to meet people because if you can't, if you can't tell people or show people who you really are, right. what are you networking for? So, that would be my advice. It's actually really great advice, if I could, because one of the things that I tell my folks. In the organization is always be prepared for an elevator pitch. Mm -hmm. You know, you walk into an elevator, you got a 30 second ride with a with a senior executive, and you got to convey to him when he goes, "Hey, what's going on in IT?" and not just start babbling about stuff. I really like your comment about brand, having your consistent brand, mm -hmm. and and I also think to add to that, it's how you carry yourself in those meetings, right? Are you carrying yourself, you know, with a strong presence and a strong stature, or are you kind of moping around trying to figure out your place. If people look at you and think that you got, as you said, you got a great brand, you can communicate what it is you want and what you want to achieve, and you look like somebody who feels confident, uh, it's really going to go a long, long way. Right? Thank you. That was all great advice. I feel like I'm sitting here and trying to sit up tall on the Don't even try. <laughs> <laughs> There's a bet who's going to be one on one, right? Who's going out? That's really what you want to know. With that, I'd like to open it up to you for our last few minutes to questions um, from our audience. How rigorous is it really to, to go through? I mean, is it a 20 hour a week commitment? Um, and when is it too late? Um, I, you know, because I'm at a certain point in my career where I've, I've achieved some of the goals that I wanted to achieve. I have a quest for knowledge. I would, I'm really thirsty to learn. But is it too rigorous if you just have a quest for knowledge? I would say if you're 90, then you should pass. But besides <laughs> that, go for it. Because you can always learn. You can always drive, you know, get to the next level personally and professionally. Um, and then, oh, how much time? Uh, whatever you think it is, double it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, a lot of people say that, but seriously, do you think it's a 20-hour-a-week commitment or 40-hour-a-week commitment? It depends if you're in full-time or part-time. Then it depends what you want to get out of it. You know, yeah. it, it, uh, Online or in and, person. And I would say <laughs> yeah. that it's, it's definitely worth it. I think even if you're 90, because <laughs> if you're, you. you're going to lead something, you lead by example. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter if it's in the corporate world or, or not, but when people know, whether that be your family or whether it be coworkers or whatever it is, a nonprofit, you have that, you went through that. And I don't care if you're 90 years old or if you're, you know, you're 29 years old or 25 years old. I'm not 90. No. <laughs> no uh, but but uh, but you lead by example, and, and I think that getting 
your MBA is, right. is always going to be worth it. So my program was online, and I probably spent at least an hour and a half and sometimes three every weeknight checking in, doing mm -hmm. the daily tasks, and then a good six to ten hours on Saturday and Sunday writing papers. Right. If that helps from a number standpoint. So that's more like 25 hours a week, yeah. I'd say. Yeah, and I, and I mean, I would add to that as well. You can, you can deal with the, that time commitment, um, you, especially if, you, if you're working, you have some sort of expertise in area. Yeah. You can sort of line up your classes Absolutely. so that you're, t you're, you're taking a very difficult and challenging class. We've got to invest a lot more time. And maybe a class that, let's face it, is sort of a little bit easier because you, you have some some expertise. So you can help manage that 20, 30 hour week commitment mm -hmm. and then also you can decide how quick you want to get the MBA. You know, if you really want to power through and knock it out in 18 months, yeah, you're going to yeah. probably going to be in for 20, 30 hours a week, yeah. but mm -hmm. it's like a band-aid, just rip it off and get it <laughs> over with, right? Yeah. I just kind of like to add one, one thing to kind of think about is not so much what the program is giving you, but also what you're giving into the program. Mm -hmm. We had a couple people in our class that were late 50s, early 60s, and what they didn't even realize is how much they contributed to class yeah. with their experience, mm -hmm. that everybody else in the class that's 25 to 30 years old has no clue what it's like out there, that this person's been out in the, in the field for 30 years and brings a tremendous amount of, of input to group discussions. Great point. The other way to save some time is, is when you have school projects, apply them to something you're doing at work, work. anyway. So mm -hmm. I had a huge marketing plan I had to do for one of my classes, and I just applied it to my annual plan at work and mm -hmm. double duty. I, I don't think, I, don't, I know this is going to sound weird, but I don't think we're busy enough. Um, <laughs> I, I think that we, we're busy, but is it with the right thing? And there's, I subscribe to that old saying, you know, if you want something done, <laughs> give it to somebody who's busy. Mm -hmm. And when you get into the your MBA, you're going to find that you're going to start doing more constructive yeah. projects. More, uh, you're going to be able to do more networking because you're in the network, and um, and and that's going to that's going to take you to where you want to be. So, regardless of whether you want to go to the nonprofit industry or an entrepreneur or climb the ladder, being busy is. I think that's where success is. And that leads to, I think somebody said, you know, the work ethic. Um, you wouldn't believe how much wasted time we have. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I know I waste a lot of time doing Lord knows what, but, but, um, but if you keep yourself busy, you'll find that other people will look to, look to you for solutions. And, and uh, at the end of the day, you know, it's your reputation. That's great. Sorry. Um, do you guys think um, where you got your MBA is um, has a lot of, I guess, like credence in behind your degree? Mm -hmm. And kind of piggyback on that, because you mentioned that so many people are getting their MBA now. Do you think it's as valuable now as it has been in the past? Would you recommend it to people to pursue? I think uh, corporate America is looking at it a little bit differently than they did in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Uh, and that they're not reaching out to take these newly minted Harvard uh, Northwestern MBAs and uh, doubling their salary uh, because they don't have experience. All they have is the, the uh, textbook background that they've picked up there and realize that they don't necessarily contribute something on day one. I personally chose between uh, a second tier school in Chicago when I uh, could have looked at uh, uh, Northwestern and Chicago because I was interested in getting it as quickly as possible with the thought in mind that after I was out 10 years, no one was going to care where I got it. It was going to be what have I done in those 10 years. It may help you get those interviews right out of school if you're from one of the top 10. Uh, but they too now struggle with uh, placing their students. So I, I am not a firm believer that it has to be from one of the top ten. In fact, there's a recent article about the fact that the return on investment from those schools that cost you $150,000 does not make sense. You're not going to get the money. You're not going to pay it back or earn it back quickly enough. The programs like you have here uh, go well beyond it if you want to look at it from an economic uh, return to get it here than anywhere else. I don't. There you go. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. It should enter into your equation. You're going to learn everything you uh, would at any other school. I, I can tell you that because I had an opportunity to go to school in Europe 20 years after I got my uh, MBA, 
and they had not taught one thing differently than the concept of economic value added that I had learned uh, in my first MBA program. So, and that was from one of the top business schools in Europe, so I don't think it matters, personally. Yeah, I mean, I, I would agree 100%, right? It's that notion of what's your experience, and then you build on the MBA, and I can tell you, any anytime I've ever, anybody's asked me, I said, the topic has come up that I have an MBA, the next question is never from what university, right? It's typically, it's simply a response, a reaction that says, oh, wow, that's great, that's something that I don't have, or, you know, what's your MBA in, right? So, so I, I agree completely, and I like your concept on return on investment too. There's a, there's a big cost for some of those schools, Absolutely. and it, you may not get it back. So, you're in a, it, getting. I think having an MBA is such an elite group of people. I don't know what the exact percentages are. I think I've heard something like two percent of the population. Maybe I'm right or wrong, but you're part of such an elite group when you have an MBA. It really becomes irrelevant where where you got it from, right? Unless it was Chris Philandro's school of business, which is <laughs> not real. <laughs> Hard knocks. <laughs> I have to add another point to that, that, that part of my reason to going to ASU was I, I do have a love for this city and the valley, and my intention is to stay here. And if we're talking about the different networks to join, you know, whether that's LinkedIn or different associations or boards or whatever, ASU has an enormous alumni following in Phoenix. And, and that right there is a huge network to join. When the cost can be the same as similar universities, that was one of my driving factors was becoming a member of that network. My undergrad came from Wyoming, and wow, there's people that live here. It's, it's not nearly as plentiful as ASU. <laughs> It's really wonderful to hear all your perspectives, and I really appreciate your time. I'm going to ask Tracy Lorenz, president of West, to just come up and give a couple of closing comments. Well, first, um, wow. So thank you for the esteemed panel. Um, I want to just, on behalf of Western Western <laughs> you. You give your insight and then build, and it was just great. I mean, I learned a ton, and thanks for everyone. I just the first time I've actually got to see everyone. So, hi, I'm Tracy Lorenz, I'm president of Western International University. It's nice to meet you. Some familiar faces, some not so familiar faces. Um, really, listen to what they said. They have great perspective. Not only are they giving you kind of, hey, this is what you do when you're getting your MBA. There's a lot of life lessons in that. And a lot of you are looking, I mean, you came here for a reason. So we talked about the pivotal moment. So this should be a pivotal moment for you in terms of you made the decision to come here and learn something. So do something with that. Take it, do something tomorrow, or wait, or do it tonight. Don't send him a LinkedIn. Because <laughs> I already did that. But really, take what they said, evaluate introspectively, and do something with it tomorrow. You know, if you don't do it tonight, do it by tomorrow. Within 24 hours, you will come up with the 10 excuses, one excuse it only takes. So do it tomorrow. So that's the only thing I would say. I mean, I'm thinking just, you know, in terms of what you guys were saying. So thank you so much. Uh, it was an hour of really a huge benefit for all of us. And I appreciate us taping this because I think it should be broadly shared with everyone. So on behalf of Western International University, thank you for coming out. I know some of you travel very far. And you guys all have busy lifestyles, so thank you for sharing your insight with us. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.